full, then I'm afraid you won't be able to join that session. So if there's something you really want to go, then I say get there just before the start time. All the abstracts are on the website, so I mean, there's some fantastic sessions this year. And for certificates of attendance, I know that's always we're asked, um, it's going to be either email myself or Jamie Stewart. Many of you um, have been contacting us, and after the event with the online evaluation forms, we will do certificates, and I'll give that email out again later on. Okay. So, only one program changed today. Um, you send these to print, and then unfortunately, uh, one of our colleagues, who was our product manager, who was coming from the States, his father is incredibly, incredibly unwell, and there's no way he should travel today. So as a result, we will be postponing this session from ideas to design. It's a really great session, but we just need him to sort of facilitate it. So instead, at fairly short notice, um, in Acorn 2, voice of the customers, so very much, Joachim Fulmer and his team are here from Mainz. They are our international engineering support team. They very much want to get an idea of what you think, how we can improve the service. So if you've got some ideas on how we can improve to look after you, so you in turn can look after your learners to improve patient safety, then, then please join that session. So that's really all I had to say. I was never going to take 20 minutes on purpose because what's far more interesting is for us to really get started. So, to lead our first session, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Richard Hellier. Richard um, has been one of our previous keynotes, and he's really unique, I think, in the simulation community. He hasn't paid me any money to say this. Um, is the team in Bristol, at the University of Bristol, use simulation to teach science and physiology principles. If you want to know more, Richard's doing a workshop later on today, and they also do a fabulous outreach service. So Rich is going to introduce our opening keynote and lead the first session. So over to you. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and I'm going to be brief as well. I just want to say a few words to introduce our introductory keynote speaker. Um, I think when we're working in simulation, we feel very much and we are at the forefront of technologies and how technologies can be applied to help educate and to learn and to train for patient safety. Um, obviously, being at the forefront of technologies, technologies keep moving forward um, and we're seeing more and more application or potential applications of technology such as VR and AR. And we're really honored um, to have Professor Bob Stone here today, um, who is the Chair in Interactive Multimedia Systems at the University of Birmingham and the director of the Human Interface Technologies team. Bob is quite rarely, I think, been both an industrialist and an academic, and that's quite a rare breed. Um, and it's an interesting perspective if you have been outside academia, like I have been for a while. Now, Bob, why we're very privileged to have Bob here, um, while we're at this kind of moving for the front, moving forward of technology, is that Bob was a pioneer of VR, probably before the term VR was even coined, I would imagine. Um, and certainly applied much of his work to surgical training devices. Um, one, one, he's got so many accolades and awards that, that he probably must have augmented himself at some stage to be able to deal with this. I mean, but one that stands out to me that I'd like to say to Helen why I'm reading this is that General Klimuk, the director of Russia's Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, lauded Bob as responsible for introducing VR to the cosmonaut program. What an incredible feat, what an incredible thing to have said about you. So there's no better person to help us navigate this increasingly complex world of VR and AR, so I'd like to welcome Bob, Professor Bob Stone. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Yes, that's, that's, that's one of my prides and joy, that one. I, they also made me a Cossack. Believe it or not, an honorary Cossack where I had to uh, dance with some interestingly clad uh, Cossack ladies and swim naked in the River Don. Uh, so, you know, all these accolades come, come at, at, at a significant price. I'm just going to start off my little gooch little timer here, so I'll try and keep the time. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, Bob Stone is my name. Yeah, I, I actually re officially retired in July, so I'm currently in Emeritus uh, in between jobs. And allegedly, the university is going to offer me a part time position to come back and carry on the work of the team. We've got two of my colleagues here, Vishen Gari and, and, and Manso, who um, I've, I've also got uh, some quotes from, from the uh, systematic review, systematic study he's been doing recently. 
The focus of the talk is please remember the human. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm hopefully not going to offend people in this lecture with some of the things I'm going to say, but I have been doing this for like 33 years now, and I carry all the mental and physical scars of being involved in VR, AR, and more recently, mixed reality, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but so I, I was quite, I was a bit, little bit ill at ease last night when people came up to me and said, you're that, you're that Bob Stone on LinkedIn, aren't you? You're the one who's always slagging off people and slagging off technology, which I do. Um, I have two, two, two aims first thing in the, in the morning, is, every morning. Is number one is to have coffee. Number two is to, not purposely, but I find myself doing it, upsetting people on LinkedIn. Um, and the reason I do that is not because I'm trolling or, 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 or being nasty, it's because some of the things that we see in virtual augmented reality you know, today, I've seen it all before. In the 1990s and 2000s, I'll go back to this in just a minute. And lessons have not been learned and things haven't changed. There's enormous opportunity in this, in this field, particularly throughout healthcare, not just surgery, but rehabilitation, mental and physical. We'll show you some of the things we're doing a little bit later on. But everyone seems to think that putting on a headset is what it's all about. The wow, the Gucci white headset, the wow effect, and it's not. Um, and, and hopefully I'm going to explain why I'm so vehemently anti some of the things we see on, online. To do that, I've got to take you back to the, the year 1990s. So I started this courtesy of a chance experience over at NASA uh, in California, and that could change my career. But in the early 1990s, when VR was just about to hit the UK, it had been going for a few years before that in the US, is that everyone started getting excited about virtual reality and healthcare and the surgical room of the future, for example. So you see everything from flying through vascular systems to people in headsets being able to see transparent images through, through bodies for training. Um, the Stanford picture on the bottom right-hand corner there of every piece, that, let's just chuck every piece of technology at that poor ophthalmic surgeon in the hope that he'll be able to do a little bit better job at removing a cataract. And again, this is something that we, we, we see all too often even today, and I'll show some update examples in a minute. But back in the 1990s, we too got very excited about it. I, we were so proud of that 3D stomach, you would not believe it. So there we have, a, you, I hope you can see the video, it's a, it's, it's a conversion of a conversion of a VHS. So we were able to go and build this 3D model of a stomach and fly through it. And you know, that for us, and then we, we did the same with some lungs and, and some 3D ribs and some hearts and stuff. And we, and we were putting people in headsets and putting them in gloves so you could point where you were looking, you could fly around the body. Great, great fun. That uh, was great, great fun. But at the same time, there was another technology that was causing issues throughout the medical fraternity, and that was keyhole surgery, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It was getting extraordinarily bad press. And it was getting bad press because individuals were being trained inadequately with inappropriate technology, and then being allowed to operate on individuals uh, who are undergoing keyhole surgery, both sort of lap coli gynecology, for example. And uh, the problem was that they didn't have any way of objectively measuring the capabilities of the trainees when they came out of, of, of training. So at that time, the National Health Service and the Wolfson Foundation set up three, well, actually four, four uh, uh, minimally invasive therapy centers across the UK. Um, London, I think it was Imperial, Dundee, and Leeds. And they also came to Manchester. Um, and they came to Manchester to help us set up what was called the Wolfson Center for minimally invasive therapy. Not to do general training, but to look at how this thing called virtual reality might stress, might improve the, lo the lot of ch uh, surgical trainees in the future. And this is, what they were, this is what they were training with. And this is the problem I've just mentioned. So you had basic, your dolly mixtures for basic training inside one of these Epicon endo boxes. You had intermediate skills training, which are grapes. Grapes are great because if you squeeze them too hard, they splat. And you can peel them off the stalks. And then your advanced trainer was chicken. So you actually peel, you actually peel the chicken skin off quite deftly using these laparoscopic instruments. Um, that's, and these things were used when the, 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 the product, the, the, the foam substrate with the balloons for the gallbladder and the, stro the red straws for the vascular systems had worn out and you couldn't afford to replace them because they were so incredibly expensive. So 1994 to 2003, we set up the, uh, the Wolfson Center for Minimally Invasive Surgery at Manchester Royal uh, Infirmary with a good friend and colleague of mine, gastrointestinal surgeon called uh, Rory McCloy. And over the years, uh, we looked into a whole wide range of, of, of techniques within virtual reality uh, to help possibly train the, 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 uh, the surgeons of the future. And that's where I made my first mistake. Nobody's perfect, and I may be critical on LinkedIn, but my God, did we make a huge mistake. You know, we, we saw all this stuff being advertised at conferences and in brochures and what have you, and we, we, we just said, yes, we've just got to use this tech. 
The surgeons definitely need this tech, don't they? And, and, and the surgeons, who are just as bad when it comes to gimmicks, were, were completely in agreement. So we had a quarter of a million pound graphic supercomputer enabling us to actually deform tissue uh, in a way that the surgeons hated. They didn't, they didn't, they, there was no way that they were going to su subscribe to this degree of tissue deformation, even though we were using this fantastic graphic supercomputer. We had top left-hand corner, autostereoscopic display. It's display that, dis that displays stereo without the use of any form of glassware whatsoever. Because yeah, you're, you're, you're operating in quite complex um, overlapping structures. Of course the surgeons need stereo, don't they? It, 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 it's obvious. And haptic feedback, force and touch feedback. We spent an awful lot of time designing and then building that rather Heath Robinson looking device so that we could actually feel tissue, we could feel vascular beating, we could feel all kinds of effects inside a small volume. Because, of course, the surgeons need haptic feedback, don't they? Uh, when they're actually carrying out these, uh, these, these tiny little operations, these, these, these tiny operations within the area that the calyx triangle or within the, the, the area around the gallbladder and the liver. And when we, just, when we, when we did, featured this, having we really been smug and happy with ourselves, we were torn to pieces, absolutely torn to pieces. There's no way on God's earth, they said, you could afford a quarter of a million pound supercomputer. There's no way that we're going to believe that, that tissue deformation is doing, is doing the kind of thing you'd find when you, open, when you actually carry out open surgery, let alone keyhole surgery. Um, we don't have stereo because we just look at a standard monitor. In, in, in theater, we just got a standard two-dimensional TV screen. And as for haptic feedback, 50-50. Some surgeons said, yes, we definitely need it. Some surgeons said not. Um, but most of them really wanted to be able to hold objects accurately in a very, very small volume. So we'd forgotten the basics. And these are the basics. This is what I, teach, what I have been teaching to my students in our human factors courses at Birmingham. The basics as advocated by a variety of people, but my favorite, simply because it's a, it's a, fant it's a fantastic book, it's been going for decades, uh, is The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. And again, not wanting to lecture on this, but what we were doing was fundamentally this. And it matters not whether the world is real or, or virtual, it's whenever you introduce any form of technological barrier between you and the world, you would then encourage these two, what he called, gulf of execution and gulf of evaluation to appear. The gulf of evaluation means that the technology barrier that you're putting between yourself and the task is influencing the way in which you perceive the task, influencing the way in which you make cognitive judgments about what you're going to be doing next. As soon as you put a barrier in between you and actually carrying out actions on the task, the effector or the actions on the task, you then got this gulf of execution issue. So for example, if you introduce gloves, virtual reality gloves, which are horrendous even today, or haptic feedback systems that don't work, then you are compromising your ability to carry out the, carry out the, the actual uh, skills that are necessary to complete that task. So you've got this vicious circle. And that's what we were doing. We were introducing all this technology without realizing what it was that the surgeons or the surgical trainees actually needed. And this was, this was a, a, the fundamental error on my part. Uh, having been qualified, I mean, I've got, I've got a master's degree in ergonomics, so we shouldn't have done this, but we were, we were wowed by the technology and wowed by the claims that people were making about this technology. So we went back into the theater, and I spent four days or four afternoons uh, in the theater with, uh, with Rory McCloy, my colleague, just observing uh, what he was doing and what his team was doing and what instruments they were using, looking at the conditions of the patients. And we were doing a, basically a, an observational task analysis, which human factors people are trained to do. Like, like it's, it's bread and butter to us. And we're looking at what was it that's modifying the task? What, what, what constraints were the instruments putting on the surgeon? What was the sequence of events that the surgeon had to go through to insufflate the body, then carry out the penetration, then carry out things like diathermy? What about task modifiers, for example, in terms of how close you're standing to your next, your, your, your surgical assistant? You know, what, what, what context are you working in? Is it, a tight, is it a very small operating room or is it a large one? And so on and so forth. But we identified all these different features. And in particular, we came across um, a number of tasks. Uh, really, we were able to identify six individual lap coli tasks. And one, when we were working with, I was working with Alan Farthing when he was at St. Mary's. He was, you know, he's, the, he's, the, he's the royal gynecologist now, so he's really, he's really made, it, uh, made it well. So we did um, six laparoscopic cholestectomy tasks and one gynecological task um, that we, we were able to identify something that we call sort of psychomotor primitives, psychomotor uh, sort of task primitives. So I, can't go, I won't go through all, all six tasks, you'll probably fall asleep. So I put task six, which is the most difficult, which involves holding a piece of tissue accurately, bringing the diathermy probe, stopping a bleeding, or, or actually carrying out some degree of cutting. Uh, that, took, that, that was actually the most complex in terms of accuracy and patient safety that we identified 
during a lap coli uh, investigation. The gynecological task was, again, holding something accurately in, the, in, a, in a small 3D volume and then using the diathermy probe to actually carry out burning to cut the tissue in a, in a very accurate linear fashion. So we were able to take those six tasks and break them down into what we call these psychomotor primitives. Grasp, maintain, maintain handling, exchange, exchange in terms of moving um, ob objects around or moving your instruments around, um, using both instruments, taking instruments out, changing them for other instruments, and also things like depressing the foot pedals, because the foot pedal was depressed to apply current to the end of the diathermy probe. So again, this is bog standard human factors stuff that we do, that we don't do all the time. Um, and we were able, as, as a result of that, to decompose these very complex tasks into very similar, it's a very simple primitives. So this is task one, which is literally holding an object accurately in 3D space. If you moved outside the volume, that, that volume, it was an error. And we were recording errors. We were recording mo motion economy. We were recording uh, contact errors. Uh, we had task three, hopefully. Here we are, task three, which was, again, this idea of using the instruments to step over tissue, to alternately step over a piece of tissue, as we, as we were seeing in the gynecological uh, intervention, and moving along, the, for example, the cystic duct. Task six, which is the most complicated one, this involves, let's say, actually handling an object. When it goes into the, into the, into the cube, you'll see three little, some of you will be able to see the three little red boxes appear. You withdraw the instrument, bring the diathermy probe back in, depress the foot pedal, and then you, without penetrating into the blue sphere, you try to simulate in a simulated fashion, burn that little red box off. If you push too far, you sort of transgressed into the, into the sphere, that was all classified as errors. But we were recording everything that the surgical training was doing, and we were coming up with objective measures. Here's the gynecological example I told you. So again, holding something accurately in a space, and then using the diathermy probe to literally follow that red line and, 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 and remove the red in as accurately as you can without, in, without actually penetrating further into the tissue. And that was hugely successful. This resulted in something called MIST, Minimally Invasive Surgical Trainer. Uh, sorry to our German colleagues. So I, know, I know MIST in German means something completely different, but this, this, is, it, it, this is what it stood for. And this is also an example, an early example, of what we call mixed reality. Now, mixed reality is not about headsets. Microsoft loved calling the HoloLens mixed reality headset. It's not. It's an augmented reality headset. Mixed reality is all about the interface and content. So on the bottom right-hand corner, we've got um, instrumented instruments, if you like. These are instruments that, will, that, that, that record the movements of the hand. Uh, and even though they're not seeing physiologically or anatomically accurate information, that brings a degree of credibility to the fact that they're using these very simple objects in order to hone their skills, in order to, for example, realize that if you move your instrument to the right or to, or, or to, the, or to the left, that what you see on screen is the opposite. It's called the fulcrum effect. So we're training basic skills. We're not training them to recognize gallbladder, cystic duct, mesentery, liver. We're actually teaching the skills they need to graduate from open surgery to, to, um, to laparoscopic cholestectomy. And as a result of that, it, it, this got so much support in terms of universities across the globe, of US, um, Ireland, uh, UK, and uh, continental Europe, uh, particularly in, in, in Germany, uh, that not only did it become the de facto trainer at the Ethicon Endo, uh, Endosurgery Training Institute in Hamburg for 10 years, it was also on sale uh, from 1997 to about 2010. And I'm afraid my, um, my previous chief executive uh, sold, the, sold the division off, and I never got a penny. But that's, that, that's the way life goes. Uh, but nevertheless, it has, it has matured since then. It, 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 and if you now go to um, Mentis, based in Sweden, you'll see that they have introduced anatomy and you have introduced physi physiology. But that was testament. That was testament to a strong human-centered design, human factors approach from the very start. Yes, we made, we, we made serious mistakes. Yes, we lost, we lost quite a lot of money, almost lost the contract completely. But we were able to pull it back with just four half days of being in, in, a, in a surgical situation with a specialized with a specialized surgeon. Well, what did we really learn? Well, we certainly learned from the very early days that so-called this thing they call immersion using VR headsets is not a prerequisite for effective training. And that's as, that's as meaningful today as it was back then. And trying to uh, try, trying to, to strive for the greatest level of fidelity or realism in training is also not a prerequisite for effective training. So simply assuming, of course, that the interactive technology is, is bound to work, again, it, that, that's, that's just foolhardy. Uh, even today, if you believe what you see on, on LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever, you're going to be in trouble. And developing VR solutions without um, a sound human-centered approach 
is also foolhardy. Again, we, we've learned that uh, at our cost. And then finally, uh, but equally important, involving specialists, subject matter experts, stakeholders, members of staff, not just at the beginning, but all the way through a divine design process is also absolutely crucial. Getting them to test every step of the way to make sure that you're not taking, making assumptions about the kind of content that they need to interact with and the technology that they will be interacting it with. There were equally other uh, projects where we applied exactly the same approach and did come up with a fairly, not, not necessarily hugely expensive, but technologically based solution. So this is uh, a European project looking at temporal bone surgery. Uh, and at the, uh, the end of the, the human factors analysis, we decided that yes, the surgeons do need stereoscopic vision because they're looking into a microscope or a binocular, um, microscope, binocular instrument when they're carrying out mastoidectomy. And therefore, that's because they need to look at physical structures, particularly if they're trying to avoid the sigma sinus, sigma sinus, or for example, the facial nerve. As they're getting deeper and deeper into the mastoid, uh, they need to be able to see in 3D within these volumes. But the important thing was, yes, they did need haptics. So at the time, we were using one of the early phantom uh, haptic feedback systems, which is still you know, a fabulous piece of kit for things like dentist training or, or, or bone drilling bone drilling, or bone burring. Uh, and the, the great thing about this, this particular piece of kit, which is literally just a joystick, which is being back-driven by windscreen wiper motors, would you believe, not only did it give you the sense that you were drilling through, th dr drilling through tissue, as long as you didn't push too hard, because th there are certain limitations with this tech, but it also made the noise. So you actually simulate the noise of going through different densities of bone. So that was giving them both a haptic and the sound cue. And for that reason, it was, uh, it, it, the, the actual study was, was very successful. But again, because of the cost and because of the, 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 the limitations, you could, and the fact that we couldn't push these drilling things to extreme, it never took off commercially. So more lessons learned there. And then more recently, a, a, a few years ago, well, actually probably about 10 years ago now, I suppose, we, we teamed up with a Leamington Spa-based uh, games company um, which was a bit of a mistake, unfortunately, because no matter how much we tried to talk to them about using human-centered design to design tasks for surgeons who had no experience of battlefield situations, no experiences of extreme trauma, who were being sent out to Iraq and Afghanistan, no matter how much we tried to tell them, they insisted on putting in things because they could. So, for example, at one stage in this demonstration, there's a fly that flies into the tent and lands on the guy's chest. Why? There's all kinds of different... I mean, some of my favorites... Yeah, this is great. You know, they, they had to put physics into the stethoscope. They just had to. Well, watch, the, watch the tube of the stethoscope. Whoa, watch that thing go. Yeah. And then again, well, it's like, and the surgeons, you know, surgeons aren't silly people. They notice this. They notice problems with the dynamics. They notice the fact that, you, you know, there's, well, okay, so here's, here's another one. This laryngoscope reflection, something called environment mapping. Just make the laryngoscope nice and shiny because it's really shiny in real life. But then, Let's get the reflections wrong. So the reflections in that laryngoscope are of the nurse and the, bo the bottom half of the patient. So you can, you, can do, don't even make it, you can see the patient's chest, his nipples. You can see the nurse. The reflection's actually wrong. And the surgeons are picking up on that. And it, we found that because they were, the, the, the surgeons were going through this and saying, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, they were losing one and a half minutes out of a four and a half minute simulated life-saving life uh, intervention, which is absolutely crazy. So again, Another lesson learned, if you're ever working with games companies, tie them down, whip them, beat them. Do not let them, do not let them put things into their games because they can. This isn't Call of Duty. It's not Half-Life 3, or whatever the next version of Half-Life is. It's a serious game, so-called. But don't put things in just because you've got the software and you've got the capability to do it, because it's distracting. It's, it's unnecessary. What we used to call hyper-fidelity, hyper it's just too distracting. But here we go. Um, this, is, this is where I've become unpopular, probably here and on LinkedIn, but we still see things like this. So here we have one of the latest um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy trainers, and you've got somebody in a headset inside an operating theater looking at a screen, when all they really need to do is look at the screen. You've got, uh, I'm not too sure how they're actually controlling these laparoscopic instruments. It's, 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 it's probably, it looks, as if it's, uh, it looks as if it's some kind of instrumented haptic feedback type solution, fine, that's great. But look around, I mean, there's, there's nothing else happening in that operating theater. The support staff, the scrub nurse, the other, the other individuals are they're just standing there, motionless. They're, they're, not, they're not contributing to the task performance at all. It's absolutely crazy. So again, think about the barriers that you're injecting. Think about the barriers you're putting into the scene. In, into the scene. Are, you really, are you really going to be giving these guys the right skills to transfer from the virtual to the real? 
Is it going to affect their, their skill fate, for example? Or if, because they've had this experience in VR, will their skills be as good three months down the line as they were the, the hour or so afterwards? Factor fiction, lots of factor fiction. I've, I, I used to collect these, I used to collect these regularly off, off, off LinkedIn, these pictures where, where groups and companies are using basically very good computer-generated imagery, videos, to show the concept of what happens when you put on a HoloLens, or you put on a Magic Leap, or you put on any form of headset, or AR headset for that matter. And they are so misleading, it's unbelievable. Now, again, with apologies to our good friends down the corridor, I, I don't like the HoloLens. If you put the HoloLens in and you use it in, well, first of all, you don't use it outside. So all these claims in the States that the American army is using it are rubbish, because once you take it outside in the sunshine, you can't see anything. If you actually use it in an operating theater, uh, the chances are because the, both the, uh, the, the ambient and direct light, the direct lighting will just completely do veiling glare, wash out the imagery on what is already a really small um, 52 degrees field of view in the case of the new HoloLens 2. So what do they do? They don't want to show you the pictures through the HoloLens or, or the Magic Leap. They'll show you these, these, these rather glitzy videos instead. Very, very misleading and a source of serious disappointment to anyone who, who ends up buying them. Here's one of my favorites. I'm not too sure why this guy suddenly stood up almost Lazarus-like, and, 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 and it's, it's walking around on top of the, uh, the operating table. Uh, but this, this is interesting. This guy wanted to show off this, this model as a, as, a, as a key function of uh, the, the Magic Leap. It's interesting. He's a clinical advisor to Magic Leap. Um, and again, you know, why? I can imagine that the, the, for, for A-level A -level biology students, yeah, maybe it's exciting. Maybe they remember it. And it, it's all overdone because you can actually buy, you can actually buy this model. I, I don't, I'm not too sure why he's doing this when he's going back on, but anyway, that's another story. But you can buy this model, this transparent model, fully animated, off a site called TurboSquid for about $120. You know, it, 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 it's all quite misleading that these companies say, look what we can do, and they'll charge you an arm and a leg, when actually, you can probably end up doing a lot of it yourself. Uh, oh, this is lovely, all these Japanese, uh, uh, is it seven? Seven Japanese, uh, seven Japanese individuals in an operating theater, all with Magic Leap, and they're all doing this, look. They're all, they're all doing the, the, the gesture control. So which Magic Leap is recognizing whose gestures? And you know, they're, they're all, they've obviously all got some, this fantastic Star, Star Wars hologram in front of them. So what's happening to the poor patient in the meantime? And, you know, and, and, and these things aren't particularly reliable at, at, at measuring your gestures anyway. Uh, so again, all this barrier, all this barrier stuff is putting, uh, the, the barrier claims of Don Norman are, are evident yet again. Apart from the cheesy music, I I, I thank you for that. I, I, I just had to play that cheesy music. Um, this has got to be the worst human, inter human interface I've ever, ever come across. I mean, I'm sorry to the guys who actually developed this, but if you put on uh, a, either a VR or AR headset, and just look, look at the text, look at the, look at the fine detail, you're never going to resolve that. You're never visually going to be able to resolve most of that inside a headset with the current you know, 2K, possibly 4K resolution if you're lucky. It's simply not going to happen. And you've got all these different things that appear on your wrist that you have to interact with. Uh, and well, how that's intuitive, God only knows. That's all I can say. <coughs> um, Oh, this is another good one. Watch, what, what's the lady, what, what's what they're doing to this chap's knee? You know, look, look he's got, look, he's got no, no glove. Look, it's like, oh, well, okay. So, it's like, how on earth are they doing that accurately? They're not because it's computer generated imagery. It's video, it's, it's post-production video. Uh, but again, you know, this is supposed to be happening collaboratively. There are, exam there are reasonable examples of collaborative surgical training, very basic surgical training across the world, but that sadly is not one of them. So if you look online, that's the, message we're, that's the message people are taking home. The future is already here. You can put these headsets on, you can go into an operating theater, and you can improve the lot of the patient, less time, more accuracy, and the patient will leave a, a happy bunny. And I say all these examples, uh, and I've got a couple more just a little bit later on. So the future is already here, but, but is it? Is it really here? And if it is here, where's the evidence? And this is my big gripe. You know, where is the evidence? Where, where are all the ethics sort of applications? Where are all the MHRA clearances? We've got companies out there, for example, already claiming that their tools have been validated, that their tools have been accepted by the Royal College of Surgeons of England. What the heck? You know, wh who's, who's, doing, who's looking after simulation at the Royal College of Surgeons at the moment to take this company's product for which there exists two of the worst 
sort of valid, validational, validational papers I've ever seen in my life. If one of my students had produced that, they would have failed instantly. It's unbelievable. Um, you know, one of my co Manson, my colleague, and, and one of my other students uh, who's, who's looking into um, uh, uh, ultrasonic, ultrasonic simulation, have had to go through hell to hell and back just to get their, just to get their, uh, their, their experimental designs and their experimental systems through MHRA. But a lot of the companies that are out there aren't even bothering with this. They're bothering with this. They, they, they go, they'll sponsor a conference at the Royal College of Surgeons, for example, and all of a sudden they talk to the right people and bang, we've been approved, we've been accredited. And it's not the case. It's not the case at all. Is there any credible evidence? So Mansour, who's sitting down here, his, his current PhD is looking into the, uh, the opportunities uh, afforded by mixed reality, that's blending the best of the real with the best of the virtual, uh, for rectal examinations. And he's just recently connect, conduct, conducted a systematic review of this area, which I thought was be really, really interesting, because finally it would help us pull out what evidence there might be out there. So he's carried out this study using the Medical Education Research Study Quality Instrument, and this is incredible. 807 articles he screened. 12 of those were found to be eligible, but only six scored greater than 50% of the maximum quality score based on the modified version of that, that, that quality instrument. Only six. And that's how it goes. Now, that's not good news. Uh, that's not good news at all. Um, but it's something we need to look at as a community. We need to start collecting papers. We need to start collecting evidence. Because as the, small, as the startup companies are involved in this go belly up, and they will, we're going to make sure, what we need to do is make sure that the, we don't see a rerun of what happened in the 1990s. In the 1990s, virtual reality took a major dip because of the lack of confidence that the, the so-called investors had, uh, had, uh, had put into, into buying these products. If you are on LinkedIn, there are two people I'd strongly suggest you keep track of. One is this guy. Um, he's in uh, Heidelberg, Heidelberg uh, Lars Reiderman, who's doing a fabulous job, fabulous job of, of collecting any form of credible evidence. He, he actually occasionally puts incredible evidence on LinkedIn because he knows it'll wind me up. But he, does, but he collects some fabulous papers, uh, and, and a lot of them are truly randomized studies. I mean, they, they, got, they, 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 they describe their participant sample, they do all the right evaluations, and, and, and so gradually we're building up this, this, this database. And the other guy to follow on LinkedIn is Tom, Tom Maddox, who's, who's become a good, good, uh, good friend and supporter of mine. And literally, day before yesterday, they produced something called the Promise of Virtual Reality in Healthcare uh, in five parts. It's not fantastic in terms of its depth, but nevertheless, it is a result of, of, of some really, really good research in putting these, these documents together. I mean, we do need, we desperately need so much more of this, we really do, because it cannot go on any longer with all these products coming onto the market. Um, I just saw one this morning. Currently over in, in Florida, in Orlando, is the big defense ITSEC exhibition. And the number of surgical trainee, trainers that are over there um, being advertised on YouTube and being advertised on LinkedIn, again with computer-generated imagery and videos, is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. We need more of this. So this is what my little team does. We try to do distilling facts from fiction. Let's say, we've been doing this for 33 years. Um, the chances are, well, we, you, when people come to us, we have turned people away by saying you, you cannot use current generation VR, AR, or MR tech, whatever you want to call it, uh, in order to a, a, accomplish your task or to stand any chance of guaranteeing positive transfer from the virtual to the real. So our battle cry has always been humans first, technology second. Donald Norman, yes, if you get a chance to read Donald Norman's book, I think you can get one of his earlier editions for about 10 pence on Amazon. And, and it, it really is worth a read, if you can get it. The other thing that's worth a read, um, A, because it is totally relevant to what we do, and, and of course the, the problem is with these standards, they tend to be expensive, but if, you, if you're interested and you want to drop me a line, I, might, I, might, I probably shouldn't say this online but if, if we're being streamed, but I, I can always slip you a copy, and I'll probably get some serious trouble for that. But ISO 9241 Part 2 or no is, is also our Bible. So we're taking all this experience that we've learned in, in human factors, and we're applying it to the, uh, this, this, this standard on human system interaction. The great thing about the standard is it's about that thin. And it's unlike most British standards or most international standards, it's very, very readable. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is what ISO 9241 is all about. It's everything that I've told you about, the lessons that we learned, understanding the context of use uh, by carrying out observations or more formal task analyses, Using that to specify the, the, the user requirements, we need to look at the individuals, we need to look at the teams that they work in, we need to look at the organizations they work in, and we need to specify the, uh, what we call the target audience description, the TAD, or, and the knowledge, skills, and attitudes, or attributes. We then do produce design solutions 
to meet those requirements, and then we go through a loop using simulation in our case to uh, evaluate the designs and then finally produce something that is worthy of going into operation and, and, and stands a really good chance of delivering the kind of objective performance outcomes that we want. So those lessons that we've learned from the past from the NHS, the European Union, and indeed the Ministry of Defence uh, feeds what we call today our mixed reality developments, which is the, the, the final part of the talk. Um, and by mixed reality, as you'll see from the, 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 the uh, example I'll give you, is all about, it's not about headsets, as I've already said, it's about taking the best of the real, the real objects in the real world that are absolutely crucial to effective training, and using those to make the virtual more believable. And this will become, hopefully become a little bit clearer as we move into the, the examples. Uh, so, and we've applied this in, not only in, in, in healthcare, but in defense as well. So there's a, a mixed reality helicopter trainer on the far left, where we're using something that is akin to the side of a helicopter, the physical aspects of the helicopter, the, the opening of the door, the position of the safety handles, and so on. We've got the 20 millimeter gunnery system, which we put in place at HMS Collingwood many years ago. Again, these guys, the, these guys don't want to engage incoming targets using an Xbox controller. Because when they're on the ship, they're putting their weight into the weapon to slew it in azimuth and elevation. So if that's the case, use an inert deactivated weapon and, and then embed that within the virtual context. Minigun, exactly the same. Uh, and then we've got the cutlass uh, bomb disposal trainer where we've got a replica of the horrendously designed interface for cutlass. I mean, we didn't design it. It's got six joysticks. Each joystick does something different depending on which camera view you selected. Unbelievable. That's another story. But we had to replicate that because that's what the armed forces were given. That's what mixed reality is about, blending the real with the virtual. And so to finish off, just to show you how we're trying, I'm, I'm, we, haven't, we haven't got it right, we haven't got it 100% right. You know, we say nobody's perfect, but we have tried to use this in our the design of something we call the, the mixed reality MERT, Medical Emergency Response Team Trainer Project, which has been going for the last, um, last three years or so. So medical emergency response teams, these are the, the, the young guys and gals who get sent out, typically in a Chinook helicopter, but, but on other platforms as well, and they go out to carry to evacuate casualties from the, uh, the scene of uh, the scene of an incursion, and preserve their life until they can get them back into the more um, the more well-equipped hospitals uh, back in places like Bastion, for example, when we were when we were over in the, in, in, the, in the Middle East. The Merck Challenge that so this is sponsored by the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine, um, which actually shares the same site as the University of Birmingham, which is incredibly convenient. And their question to us was. Can virtual reality or associated technologies deliver an affordable small team, three people, dynamic exposure, context exposure training? It's not clinical. We're not doing clinical training. Hence, the mannequins we're using are not functional. They're kind of functional, but they're not wholly functional. Uh, so it's not encompassing basic or advanced clinical skills. A more transportable solution than that currently in use. Top left-hand corner, £100,000 for that wooden box which is supposed to look like the inside of a Chinook helicopter, and, it, and it's, it's horrendous. You can't move it. Uh, the, the, the mannequins, they've got very early Simman mannequins that are falling to bits. I mean, not because they're, they're representing trauma, but because they are falling to bits. Uh, we've got uh, and a reconfigurable trainer, importantly, capable of being able to change from a Chinook to another platform, such as a hovercraft or a landing craft or, or, or a military vehicle. And also, as important, is a solution that attends to the needs of the instructor, not just the trainees. Because that's something, again, that simulation-based developers tend not to do very well. They forget the instructor, but we need to be able to give them something where they can do an after-action review and debrief once the trainees have got through their, um, got through their steps, their, 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 their training. So we started off with a series of observations with colleagues at uh, Royal Air Force Bryce Norton, the tactical medical wing, and Royal Air Force Odiham. And again, just getting briefings from these guys, watching them do their thing in this, little, in, in this trainer. And just like the original Mister, we came up with a whole number of, of tasks and context and task constraints and so on, which defined the way we were going to design this trainer. Now, this is the mixed reality concept day one. Down at the bottom is a virtual reality Chinook that I'm moving around. Look what's happening. In most virtual, even with the best of collision detection in simulation, it's quite possible that you can stick your head through the wall of a Chinook. Or worst case, you can go into the cockpit, and you walk through the cockpit, and you know, it's as, as, if you, as, as, if you, as if the whole thing's invisible, transparent. That's not good enough. These guys are working in very constrained conditions where they don't want to be distracted by their elbows going through, through virtual objects. So we decided that this time what we would do is we would, we would build an, a simple inflatable enclosure, which is about the same width and the same height as a Chinook helicopter, roughly, and we would then 
carry out the virtual reality experience inside, inside, that, uh, in, inside that enclosure, with the aim being that, the, that the, the trainees would feel constrained, physically constrained, even though they were wearing headsets. So the, Mert, the mixed reality simulator, as we called it, again, what we were trying to do was, was bring this, the, the virtual and the real together closely, uh, has the physical elements. So you see the inside of the first, the, the, the first, um, the first enclosure, we've got, yeah, we've, got a, we've got stuff from all over the place. There's an M60 machine gun there we got from a gift shop in Bobby Tracy in Devon, would you believe? Don't, don't ask. We've got a minigun sticking out the side, which we got from www.mrminigun.com in the States for about 120 quid. And we had to get the police to help us get, import it into the UK. That was hilarious. And we've got this trauma. We use a, uh, we've been using this trauma FX um, sim body, uh, which we affectionately call Steve the Stiff. Um, who is accurate in every detail, um, but you can actually strap things onto him, like, for example, you can strap on a, a blown-off leg, you can put machete wounds, gunshot wounds, and so on. 